From the state level, we now travel south on today's episode of the Producer Podcast, as I'm joined by Biga Metzner from the Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission to talk about when you need to work with them while filming in Utah and what makes their area of the state perfect for your next film. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, no, I've been uh, looking forward to this since uh, I found out you guys even existed uh, just a couple weeks ago. Us guys, me, the film commission. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, office of one. Uh, been like that for a few years now. Had an assistant a while back um, and, and one prior to that. But uh, but yeah, as of as of today and for the past year and a half or so close to two years it's been yeah the moab to monument valley film commission me being the moab to monument valley film commissioner okay yeah you know wearing many hats as Mm -hmm. film commissioners do in general but having to play all of the roles of multi-staffed offices as one human so it's always interesting i bet but yeah, maybe to start, uh, just give like a little background on yourself and how you came to be the film commissioner there. Okay, a little background. Um, it's a long story, but I uh, to break it down into shortness, I guess that I I've, I've been in the film industry since 1997. I started out as a production assistant on a movie in Los Angeles. I'm born and raised in New York City. Okay. But I, um, but I uh, had a friend uh, who was had written and was directing for the first time. He's an actor, was directing his first movie. And I called him up from New York because I had heard that he was doing that and said, can I work on your movie? And he said, I'll call you back. And then he called me back and said, OK, you can work on my movie, but you need to move to Los Angeles. You need to find a place to live. You need to find a car to drive. You need to get to work on time and excuse the curse word. But I said, okay, great. And so I moved out to Los Angeles and started as a production assistant. On there, I met a cost the costume designer who liked my sense of style, being a New Yorker. Uh, and I uh, she was going on to do her next movie in New York City. Um, and she had never been there before. And she asked if I wanted to join the wardrobe department. And... Uh, and show her around New York uh, because she had never been there before and be her shopper. So that's how I started in wardrobe. I ended up working with that costume designer, um, worked my way up from shopper to her assistant costume designer over about a six year period. Um, In the meantime, back in to flip, flip back a little bit, I actually had come to Moab, Utah in 1989 on a photo shoot. Hmm. Um, And, and I ended up, uh, buying a little trailer in a trailer park in the early nineties. And then I got into the movies, like I said, in 97. And then in my downtime, I would just come back to Moab and chill because I did have downtime between movies or commercials, whatever I was working on. And then um, at a certain point, I, uh, um, I was gone a lot. I had a kid here 17 years ago. And when I first had him, I chilled for a while and then I went back to work. And I went back to work and I was, I left him here a lot with his dad. And I kept checking in with this thing called the film commission, Mm -hmm. wonderful person who ran it at the time um, and saying like, you know, I'm a super qualified wardrobe person that happens to have a place in Moab. And, you know, is there anything, you got anything going on? And I mean, years of that. And I actually never booked a job in Moab doing wardrobe (laughs) in all those years. But at a certain point, she actually was able to get uh, an assistant and she knew that I've been in the industry for a really long time. And so she uh, asked if I wanted to try and find a way to be in Moab more full time with my kid. Um, And if I wanted to work as the film commissioner assistant. And so I did. And I kept going back to New York for a while, just working part time, Mm -hmm. working. The last gig that I had done was on a TV series called Blue Bloods. Okay. Um, And I was, uh, had gone back to set costuming. So I, anyway, she ended up hiring me as her assistant. Eventually she actually resigned and, um, 
and I it took me another eight or nine months uh, of the city of Moab, who I was working for at the time to, um, they asked me if, you know, if I wanted to be the film commission director. And I, it took me a really long time to give up my career that I had been doing since the mm-hmm. 80s. And then I, um, took on the job eventually 2016 as the film commission director and worked for the city of Moab and got funded also by the county. And then about a year and a half ago, I was taken over just by the county. Um, okay. So I work for Grand County right now, and that's also in flux as of this moment, but um, we'll not dig into the details of that. Uh, but yeah, I've been film commissioning, I guess. What's that? I'm not a mathematician. I'm a creative, but, you know, 20, basically 2015 till, till now, uh, you know, it's a lot of years mm-hmm. of you know, being, yeah, facilitating film productions that come to the area. And I love it. I mean, it's a great job. And it seems like, you know, for me, being, having been involved with film my whole life, really, and my whole career to be able to get into it um, in this capacity and helping facilitate on all these different levels, wearing all these different hats, but having a background in in working in films and working in commercials and working on in high fashion and things like that. Like when any of those types of projects come to the area, I kind of, I know what, I know what it is that they're looking for and what they need, you know, it's like in my blood. So that was a really long version of my backstory. You could cut out half that, but. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's, that's good. No, it's, it's always interesting to hear. You know, you were doing wardrobe. I know Derek at the the state level, he was a locations guy before he went uh, to the film office. So it's been interesting to hear how different people lined up there. It's true. I I mean, it's so, you know, I feel like in in all the film commissions across the globe now, and like I said, you know, according to whether it's lore or reality, you know, the Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission is the longest ongoing film commission in the world. But you know, I meet film commissioners from all these other countries and all these other places in the U.S. and all these other states and regions and territories and jurisdictions. And each person comes at it from a totally different perspective. And some just come from administration and some come from other government things. So some are under tourism, some, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, but the, the the amount of actual film commissioners that I know that come from a production background are not that many. I mean, there's okay. a bunch not that many. And, you know, I think it, it's really just depends on what the people are that you're working for want and how you can help, you know, what that means in terms of facilitating, you know, it's a joke, but not a joke. And I someday might actually happen, but there is no handbook on what it is to be a film commissioner. And I think it would be a really cool thing. I mean, whether it's just U S wise, because mm-hmm. anything out of, out of the U S is handled in a different way manner also but you know to actually have some kind of a handbook at least the basics where you can hand it to your government entity and be like hey this is really what we're trying to accomplish and sort of how we do it and you know but no two days are alike ever no two requests are alike no two projects are alike you know it's just like an endless you know re-navigating how your brain works and how you you help you know these projects come to life but it's so fun i mean seeing them from scratch, you know, these, or hearing a project from just tabula rasa to, to becoming these giant projects or some of them just smaller, just even commercials. Yeah. It's just great collaboration, you know, next I'd love to just kind of hear what the area that you cover, like what that all entails, what that has to offer um, in terms of like a film, what filmmakers might be looking for, for locations and stuff like that. Yeah. What do, what does this region have to offer? I have to say that it, I, I handle, I handle two count. I am the, I'm the regional office to the state office. Okay. And I'm one of the regional offices, but I, I handle Grand County and San Juan County. So that is Moab to Monument Valley. Mm-hmm. It's a good 150 miles and, you know, distance on either side, but um, a lot of, a lot of miles, but in the state of Utah um, and actually in the world, I'd say it's some of the most extraordinary landscapes you've ever seen and incredibly diverse. So the area that I 
that I represent is obviously, or not so obviously, very well known for its iconic red rocks, mm -hmm. known as John Ford country, you know, John Wayne country that, um, you know, it, the filming started in 1920s in Monument Valley and then started here in the Moab area in 1949 with the John Ford movies. And then, you know, it's really, it, the the red rock aspect of it is really what makes it what it is but we also have mountains we also have the colorado river and the green river and you know high desert low desert trees i mean it really just sort of runs the gamut uh caves um you know and kind of anything off road outdoor sports recreation style but horses and cowboys and you know and it and it's not just one genre specific although everyone likes to call it john ford country i mean there's been as many sci-fi, thriller, horror, romance, comedy, you know, things mm -hmm. filmed in the area too. And and the filming history here is just, you know, extraordinary. But it it leads me to no two days are alike in terms of what it looks like here. You know, that's yeah. some the beauty of it is that every day the light is different every day the weather is different the contrast on the rocks is different when there's snow on the red rocks it's one of the most extraordinary things too you know like it just doesn't ever cease to amaze me and i've lived here on and off for you know 30 years now and, and it doesn't get old and it doesn't get old in terms of filming either like it is no you know people would just were to say you know what's already been done but that's impossible it's never you know it's been mm -hmm. it's never been done in whatever way they might envision it Right. Um, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just an extraordinary spot on the planet, um, that there really doesn't really exist in other places. Um, it, it's got everything and, and great crew to work with, mm -hmm. you know, on top of that, like in the state of Utah, there's, you know, uh, as, some people know, you know, with four crew deep, you know, you can, there's somebody from every department that can, is able to work in films. And um, in Moab specific, we have a, a very good crew base. We don't have one crew deep. Okay. But, um, but we can bring, people bring people in from, or down from Salt Lake to, to shoot here often. And, you know, there's also definitely crews that bring their people in from wherever it is that they're coming from, because sometimes they just trust to working with people that they know versus trusting that there's some really qualified people who live in rural Utah, but there are, you know, don't want to yeah. forget. I mean, there really are. It's like, you know, there's a production directory that can lead people there and I can help facilitate that type of thing. But yeah. I wanted to follow up because you did mention snow a little bit. And that was something when Derek brought it up, I, I was like, oh, you guys do get snow there. I, I didn't picture that. So like, do you see decent snow like in, your area of the state or is that more up north we it's it is primarily up north but because we have mountains we have this incredible forest service land called the LaSalle mountains um the Manti LaSalle and mm -hmm. it's literally like a 20 20 minute drive from desert town into this mountains and you know beautiful winding roads for great for filming yeah um, there and the roads that lead to it are incredible for filming that go along the Colorado River. But yeah, so there's snow. We get snow in the mountains, definitely. It actually stayed very long this year. We had snow up until middle of June, I think, even. Oh, wow. Better than that. Um, but it was a crazy snow year in general. But in town, we do get snow, but it usually melts. I mean, there's it's hard, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't stick around. We definitely mm -hmm. have gotten feet. Um and then on the north facing side of some of these beautiful mesas and buttes and things we have that face north, the snow might last on there a little longer. Um, but on the south facing ones that usually melt. So, but yeah, the, the, it's not, we don't have, we're not a ski resort, although as many people would love for that to be the case, but there is skiing. We do like backcountry alpine skiing. Mm -hmm. um, here in the Salles and uh but it's not like what Utah is known as you know the greatest snow on earth that's that would be the northern part you know yeah. <laughs> the Wasatch Front and whatever those ranges are called up there in you know Park City and Sundance and snow 
bird and Elta and all those. So yeah, those are like ski ski, but we do get snow. Well, and it's actually, you know, in terms of shooting, I do pitch it often, you know, mm-hmm. it's less people traveling through um, the hotel route, room rates go down because of the off season and it's still filmable, you know, if, right. if, you, want, if you want the snow, if you don't, I mean, there's so many things that people color these days anyway, you can take it off or not, but it's just, it's a nice time of year to, to be here. Um, and there's, yeah, there's just less influx of, of people coming in because it is quite a tourist destination. I guess I'd love to hear, cause you're the first state that I've talked to that actually has more than one film commission. So like, how exactly do you, how does that work within the higher state level in terms of like how, how you're to work together, what things, you know, if a filmmaker brings it up to you, you're just going to send them to the state level office versus you being able to help them with. It goes both ways. If a call goes into the state office and they're looking for this type of landscape environment, Mm -hmm. then the state office will, um, loop me in to whatever that is and they'll loop in a couple of the other film offices that aren't necessarily film commissions but they're film offices that are representatives of the state too um that have a similar vibe to the landscape and then um and then they usually just you know leave it off in wherever it is that those people want to pursue yeah Uh, but but the other way around my film office, my film commission does not handle the film incentive program in the state. The state office does. So if someone wants to shoot a movie and use the Motion Picture Association film incentive program, I can lead introduce them to the state office um, and they'll they can do the application through there, even if they want to film in my area which is totally great and exactly as we want it to be because I'm in rural Utah and right now the, the incentive is a rural Utah incentive. Mm-hmm. So, but in just in terms of the application process and who makes the decisions about what's getting made in the state that has nothing to do with my office. Um, but we collaborate constantly. I mean, we're, we go to a lot of conferences together. Uh, we share I my film commission shares a database with the Utah Film Commission. So if you go on to the Utah Film Commission website, um, it will have all the pictures and location gallery that I have on mine. We also share the production directory for crew listing um, and support services. And um, so it's a shared database. Um, when you go to my website, it it basically just pulls out the southeastern Utah specific my area Mm -hmm. and production directory, but you can then expand on, you know, and go into look at the rest of the state by going to the Utah film commission office. So, okay. I mean, we do a lot together and they're great. I mean, I've been working with, you know, the Utah film commission since I started and uh, incredibly supportive and very, very talented, wonderful people. And, you know, and there's a lot of them. So lucky them, they have, you know, (laughs) I don't know how many, if it's five or seven in the office now, uh, but they each wear their own hats and then they intermingle a bit with certain things, but, um, but they're very helpful and, and I have come down for some of the scouts that began through their office and our larger projects, the Utah Film Commission will be involved with those at the get-go, just making sure that everything um, is working out, you know, and coming down here, no one, no one hates coming down here to, for a little recce. One thing I did want to touch on that you mentioned is how your area can be very touristy. Um, And so I guess I'd love to hear like, what are some things producers should be keeping in mind if they are looking at filming during those more heavy tourist times of the year? I think that um, there's always a way to get everything done. It doesn't matter how many people are around, but okay. You know what I mean? And film and I help facilitate very small productions and independent films and reality TV and giant major, you know, Hollywood ish or not Hollywood motion pictures, um, regardless of the amounts of people are here. You know, Mm -hmm. there's a there's a way it does take a budget. 
Um, like I said, sometimes in the off season, it's a little better for prices of hotels and stuff, but there's a lot of, because there's been so much filming and it's, it is good for the community in so many ways that there are hotels that, you know, will help make, uh, take, you know, discount some of the productions if they're working through the film commission or they'll just discount if they have a certain amount of people for a certain amount of days, you know, there's ways mm -hmm. to work there's workarounds for lots of stuff. I think the biggest thing is that everyone needs to be aware of, you know, not everywhere in the world do we have this incredible thing called public land. Okay. But we do uh, a very large percentage of the jurisdiction that I facilitate is public lands. And that's from Bureau of Land Management, BLM land. Um, I have two national parks. I have a state park. Uh, the two national parks being Arches National Park and Canyonlands National Park. And the state park is Dead Horse Point State Park. Then we have a handful of recreation areas that are also on public land. So those, and then and the percentage of private land, there is some, but it's a smaller percentage, but those are pretty extraordinary places for filming too. So what my meaning for that and talking about public land is that public land is public. And it can't be exclusive. So when people mm -hmm. come, they're like, hey, I want to shoot at this one location, but it's on BLM land. Can we shut it down? The answer is usually no, you can't shut it down. You can ask nicely, you know, if people want to go and climb the tower that happens to be in the area where you're filming, you can say, you know, can you hold off for another 10 minutes and we'll be done filming? You know, there's ways, there's workarounds. And yeah. we do intermittent traffic control on the roads and that happens all the time too you just it's it's about permitting it properly and that's the biggest thing for me and my office is you know if you it's not a requirement to go through the film commission through me um but it would it's very helpful i do know i have a background in it and i've been around enough and have in a really good relationship with all of the different land use agencies that i had mentioned mm -hmm. and some of the others that i hadn't even the forest service Sitla, which is the School Institutional Trust Lands Administration, the State Fire and Sovereign Lands that runs the actual deals with the river itself. So I know all of those people. I don't do the permitting through my office, but I can help you navigate to who you're going to speak to, or I can help you find a local professional location scout or location manager in the end that can, you know, help facilitate that process also. Um, I do a lot of the initial stuff just to sort of inspire those people to want to see it more in person than just in pictures, because right. I, no matter what, pictures don't do it justice. It does do it justice in film, but it doesn't, you know, and but it, and pictures are incredible, you know, but to come and see it with your own eyes is really you know, it's, that's the kicker, you know, that's the one where you're driving down the road and someone goes like, stop, I need to take a picture. And I'm like, we haven't even gone anywhere yet. And goes, stop. I need to take a picture. You know, haven't even gone anywhere. Yet. Then you drive for a while and you, then I'm like, just wait till we turn around and go the other way. You know, it's like, it's, it's really, it's really mind boggling and extraordinary. So anyway, that's like my long spiel of, yeah, I mean, public is public, and but there are permitting agencies, and we've been doing making movies and commercials and films and all the stuff that I had mentioned for so many years that each of those land use agencies is aware mm -hmm. and they're really good about trying to help make it happen. You have to give yourself time. A lot of them are asking for a little bit. You know, some of them used to ask for two weeks to issue a permit. Now they're most of them are requiring at least a month. Okay. For permits. Um, certain things are not allowed at all. Like you cannot fly a drone in the national parks um, in any state. Um, you can't fly a helicopter, but you, there's a, with enough time, you might be able to do helicopter in some places, but probably not the Monument Valley Tribal Park. Um, I just, a fixed wing plane can work as a, you know, an aerial thing inside a park but the all of the public lands the all of the blm land does allow for those things uh, okay for permitting so you can fly a drone on blm land you, and you can during a certain time of year at dead horse point state park and um and helicopters so you know there's just like all these like the knowledge base 
that's where the handbook comes in, but it does change occasionally. That's where my brain comes in, you know, like, and then, like I said, there's other local film professionals on the ground who also have awareness of all of these things too. And um, I am a free service. The film commission is a free service in the state of Utah. The Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission is, you know, so initial scouting mm -hmm. and things like that. And all the phone conversations of inquiries and whether it's hours you know, or days spent on the phone that no one's paying for my services um, at all. Um, when you're hiring a local, you are, but those people, you know, can can move things forward in a different way um, than, than I can uh, for certain things. Sounds good. Because, yeah, I know sometimes just finding the right permit has been the biggest struggle <laughs> for yeah. me going to different states. Yeah, but doing it right is a big deal. I mean, we keep getting these rogue people coming down and, you know, they kind of mess it up for everybody because they yep. just come and film or they heard that, you know, the BLM is no longer issuing permits. And to a certain extent, that for a certain type of project under a certain amount of people and under a certain amount of vehicles, you don't need a permit, but you still have to go through the process mm -hmm. of applying for the permit and having them or applying doing the pre-application questionnaire, let's say, with the BLM and having them say, oh, based on what you want to do, where you want to do it, and the amount of vehicles and the amount of people, you don't need a permit. But that that gets you, you know, checked off the list of yep. that you don't have to. And then I often suggest, regardless of that, um, even though it would then potentially cost more money to get a permit issued, which are not very expensive for the area. I mean, I don't think compared to other places. Um, I often suggest to some of the projects that are uh, more intense and more involved to actually get a permit, ask for a permit to be issued anyway, so that you mm -hmm. have reliability yep. uh, in place and you have your certificate of insurance in place. And, you know, like all the parts that I would want if something was to go awry, which you never hope will happen, but you know, mm -hmm. if you're just out there on your own, guerrilla filmmaking, and something happens, then, you know, you have no legs to stand on to, you know, to go back to. So, right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting quandary. And there is, in this area, I mean, I don't know how it is in other states, but I don't think other states have this many different types of land use agencies either. Uh, um, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, you can go up to, you know, it's what's famously now called Thelma and Louise Point. Okay. Which used to be called Fossil Point. Um, but I don't even think you can Google search it as Fossil Point anymore. I think you actually have to Google search it as Thelma and Louise. But it takes you, the, the directions, like, unless you know, you, it takes you around this really long way up through Canyonlands and Island in the Sky and then back down this incredible switchback road called the Schaefer Trail but there's a much easier way to get to it from, mm -hmm. uh, from the front side and not going all down this Schaefer Trail and into the National Park. Um, and you're staying on BLM land the whole time. But once you get up to Fossil Point, AKA Thelma Louise Point, it is two different land use agencies at a, on one of the pinnacles, basically. Like yep. you jump to the left and you're on, on Sitla land, the one I had said, the school institutional trust land, as you jump to the right, and you're on BLM land. And so, you know, it's like, do you want to film here? Do you want to film here? Are you going to need to uh, talk to both of those different land use agencies, SITLA and BLM, in order to make sure that you have your permit in place? And you're, are you doing driving shots on the road leading up to it? You mm -hmm. know, because that's like the road and it's different than if you're standing there with a tripod or standing there with a crew, you know? So right. anyway, it's all, yeah, uh, all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all the things that are trapped in my brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you notice like working with filmmakers that maybe there's certain things they forget that like you can help them with in that pre-production planning process that if they would just ask you, their life would be so much easier uh, than them doing it on their own. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, not all the time for sure. I mean, there's definitely... It depends on who your coordinator is or who the producer is, or, you know, like there's a, obviously some like incredibly brilliant, talented, you know, people who get all of the parts together, but mm -hmm. 
I think the assumption that because you've done it somewhere else that you're going to be cool doing it here too is something that I like to, you know, I'm not, I'm not enforcement. I'm a film commissioner. Like I can't right. stop something and I can't, but I can suggest and write. Yeah. You're like, did you, did you think about the fact that you might want to hire a medic mm -hmm. to be there? I mean, that's a basic, but sometimes even with that, you're like doing a climbing thing, you know, it's like, um, did you, yeah. I mean, I don't want to try and think of other examples of that, but yes, what you said is very true. I think that, um, getting in contact with your, what, where, whatever country you're in and whatever territory you're in and whatever region you're in and whatever state, um, getting in touch with your local film commission can be very useful. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to pat myself up and back and say like, I'm the most useful, but I, <laughs> I've gotten some good compliments, you know, as a film commissioner across the globe, mm -hmm. you know, it's cute and it's sweet. And I, and I take that like very, uh, you know, it's very flattering, but I, uh, but I think that, yeah, there are bringing in, I mean, we, there are production assistants in Moab, a plethora yeah. of them. I understand that you, people like to work with their own, production assistants, but really mean, and, and not to, I would like, I started out as a PA, so you got to start somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's certain things like if you were you hiring local is very helpful to any project, not. And, and like I said, you don't hire me. I'm just the initial f fixer facilitator, but to, to lead you in the right direction and point you into here's the crew directory and you can hire locals. But yeah, when you have people coming from outside of, uh, not even, yeah, coming from outside of Utah or outside of the country to a place like this where the elements are extreme. It's not a joke. It, and the and the, the idea of like, you have to drink water constantly, whether it's hot or it's cold because you're in the desert is true. And protecting mm -hmm. your, you know, wearing a hat and bringing multiple different layers because you could wake up in the morning and it's, you know, I don't know, 30 degrees. And then by the middle of the day, it's 90 degrees or, you know what I mean? Like it's so bringing in production assistants from other places, sure, bring one, bring two, but also hire local because it's better for our community and it's better for our area. And a lot of our locals know better how to handle these extreme environments. And when you need somebody to run into town, to go grab a sandwich, they'll know where to go or if they need right. to uh, you know, you're out of batteries for the blah, blah, blah. It's not like, and you don't have cell service, then, you know, the locals know, like we, that's, yes. I, so I'm, I, I feel very strongly about that. I think that, um, but again, I can't, it's a, it's a recommendation. It's a suggestion and, right. and, and not just with PAs, but we have great grips and electrics and we have great location managers and great location scouts and camera people and you know drone ops and i just talked to a guy yesterday i've got a new helicopter in town that can fly five passengers and it's got ac and it has camera mounts on it are you kidding me like nice. it's so awesome like we've had classic air medical you know they're out rescuing people and search and rescue helicopters and things like that but this is like an actual and like I said, we've had them before, but sometimes they come and sometimes they go. And right now there's a helicopter on the ground that's like an A-star. And I'm mm -hmm. so thrilled because there are people who want to go out for scouting on, in helicopters. And then there's people who want to shoot and taking aerials in certain places. You know, it's like, I think, so recognizing, again, going back, like that there are incredibly qualified individuals who've worked in the industry here, some of them for over 30 years or under over 35 years. And some of them who, you know, like, or since the nineties or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. you trusting in the area that you're going to, that there are people that know, maybe know a little better and maybe can help you just because they do. And I mean, come on, like off when your suggestions for restaurants, I, you know, I'm a New Yorker and I lived in LA for 15 years. Like, you know, I know good restaurants too. Like work, you use us yeah. for all the things for like even that simple stuff or like, right. Where is the best place to buy a shovel? You know, I don't know. You know, like it's weird. It is. It's rural Utah. We don't have big box stores. 
sorry, that's one thing I don't have. You're going to have to drive to Colorado an hour and a half away to go to anything that has, you know, is, is big boxy okay. um, or, or to um, price has a super one. I mean, I'm not going to pinpoint any of those stores, but you know, there's uh, and then Salt Lake city is three and a half hours away. Not bad. Um, but you know, you, you need to bring in stuff or stuff comes, comes down from other places or you find it locally and then you're actually, uh, you know, helping the local businesses and the, to, to do better right. and to, to shut down because, and, and again, it's been done for 75 years here. It's not like reinventing the wheel. You know what I mean? Like you can find this stuff here. Mm -hmm. You just need to know who to ask or yep. how to do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's a choose your own adventure every time, but it's fun. I bet. Yeah. No, I, I have some friends that would very much enjoy using that helicopter uh, yeah. <laughs> if they ever come out there for projects. So I'm going to start wrapping things up here. Um, first question I have for you is just like, what would be one piece of advice you'd give to a filmmaker that this is their first time working with a film commission? My advice would be have a list of questions written down uh, so that you so that you can find the answers to what your needs are mm -hmm. um, without a doubt, like just being very clear. It doesn't matter if you don't know where you want to film in an area, it, but it matters to an extent, even if you're doing a bid on a commercial. I mean, I don't know if you're talking more film film wise or you're talking like, uh, you know, independent versus commercial that because every production company runs itself differently. But oh, yeah. um, for, for me, if you have a, a pitch deck or a storyboard or a visual of some kind of what it is that you're after, the mood that you're into, that you're looking for. And honestly, even if you sent a picture of a specific rock when you're talking about my rocks, <laughs> I can be, I can usually help find or a valley that has a certain thing in the distance. Like those, those things are helpful. Um, that's a kind of an interesting question though. I don't know. And I don't think I'm answering it properly. I think, um, cause sometimes you don't know. I mean, if you knowing what your budget is, mm -hmm. uh, knowing what you're after, are you looking for the vibe of a small town and shooting in the town in the city, which has a different process than if you're shooting in the national park, you know, ask, just being able to ask the right questions and it's okay. It's like that whole, there's no stupid questions, you know? Yeah. It's a learning curve, but don't not get in touch with someone because you think it's a stupid question because it can help you in the end to fulfill your project in a better way. And if you're dealing with a film commission um, that is knowledgeable, then they will be able to help you. That is what we are here for is to facilitate and help fix. And we can help you, like I said, with any local crew accommodations, where's the best place to stay. We can't show specific favoritism on the best place to stay, but I mm -hmm. a list of hotels and people, hotels that are film friendly and, you know, what's in your budget. I mean, there's like so many, there's so many questions we can answer that you'd think we can't. So use us because we're free. Sounds good. And so then uh, my final question is just like, where can people go to like find you online or get in contact with the Moab to Monument Valley Commission? Get in touch with me at the Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission. The uh, you can, my website, which is also, like I said, shared with the Utah Film Commission in terms of the database is, and also very pretty to look at, is uh, filmmoab.com um, is probably the best. You can also, uh, Facebook is great. There's the Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission Facebook page. Uh, there's also the Film Commission Instagram page, which is at filmmoab. On all of them, actually, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram are all at Film Moab. Okay. Um, you know, emails are great. Phone calls are great. Um, 
on my on my website there is uh in the contacts page and on the main page is actually a production inquiry form so okay. if you're thinking about filming here you just go to those either of those pages and you can push on the orange button and fill out the google form which just gives a basic and even if it's a bid or even if it's an idea or if it's just a, you don't even know if you're coming to scout yet or you want to just come and scout then you know that just gives us that aggregates ag is that the right word a role assimilates mm -hmm. aggregates with the utah film commission so we can keep track of projects that are even just inquiring and whether um they come or not and then at the end of the show uh if you're here and i i try to send you a moab rap survey and get numbers of you know the the data that the places that we are employed by care about like yeah hotel rooms did you use and for how many nights and how much do you spend in moab and how much did you you know like the data all that stuff honestly i mean i didn't talk about that at all but that's um that's huge for us keeping our jobs and being able to he be here as a free service to filmmakers mm -hmm. is you know trying to give us the data of from what it is that you spent here you know, and we try. Obviously, we want your budgets to stay as low as they can too. It's not like anybody's trying to like, you know, right. But uh, yeah, all those the the number and the data, the stuff that I don't love as much. That's not the creative side. Is actually what the people, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the tourism office or the government office or whatever it is, whoever it is that the film commission is working under, is really what they care about. Um, but yeah, filmmoab.com. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming on the show today and sharing with us about uh, the Moab to Monument Valley Commission. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. And yeah, if anybody that has any questions about anything, like I said, small or large, uh, this film commission helps, you know, from and helps uh, here. Let me throw this one out because it's actually true of me. All right. I treat every project that hits my phone or my computer with the same energy and passion and respect from the smallest scale to the highest scale. So whether you're a young student filmmaker who wants to come and shoot here or come and do one of my local film competitions, turn, short turnaround film competitions, that's great. But I help, you know, the, from the smallest level to the highest level, you know, again, I had Kevin Costner here for, you know, his Horizon season series one and Horizon series two, these series of four movies that he's shooting. And I treated him the same way I do the other filmmaker who made the horror movie. Like I don't, there's no disconnect there. To me, every, anybody could be the next Steven Spielberg. Yes. Coolest, or anybody could be the next Wes Anderson or, you know, whoever your favorite filmmaker is, you never know. And I like to give everybody that same attention and energy. So, um, and I hope that all other film commissions do that too. But again, there's nobody telling them how to do it. Yeah. So. And with that, we're going to ride off into the sunset on this episode of The Producer Podcast. Until next time, make sure to subscribe to The Producer Podcast. And thanks for listening.